Hi, I'm Bruce Lipton, and I'd like to welcome you to the second installment of our free video series on how beliefs control our life and our health. Firstly, I want to thank all those who watched the first video on the myth that genes are the cause of disease. And I'd like to thank all of you who provided comments on that interesting video. Today's video is about the myth that genes cause breast cancer. And this is a very important topic for the people in our audience because how many lives have been destroyed or damaged and how many relationships have been lost because of this dreaded disease. My information about breast cancer is really based on my research as a scientist in cell biology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and later as a research scientist at Stanford University School of Medicine. So the information I'm going to talk about is really predicated on the basic understanding of a new science called epigenetics. I'm the author of three books on the nature of how beliefs actually control our individual lives, how our beliefs control civilization, and how our beliefs actually unfold in creating wonderful, loving relationships. The science that I use in these books is from the research that I did at the University of Wisconsin and further research at Stanford. Originally, when this new insight I found about how cells were controlled by the environment revealed itself to me in my laboratory research, I found there was a problem because at that time, all of my colleagues in the medical school were really working on genes because that was the big topic of the day. And what was so different was that my research revealed that the cells were controlled by environmental signals and not by the genes themselves. Because my topic was so off base compared to the conventional beliefs at that time, most of my colleagues looked at my research as some kind of artifact or just some kind of distortion of what was going on in my tissue culture experiments. I realized at that time that it really wasn't valuable for me to stay in that particular environment because I had to keep defending myself about experiments that would be repeatable every day and I showed the same results all of the time. This ultimately led me to leave my tenured position at the medical school at Wisconsin. And then on my own, I began to study the nature of how quantum physics and the new epigenetic science is really controlling our lives. This ultimately led me to a job interview at Stanford University, which I'll never forget because of the extreme craziness of it all. I went to Stanford to really talk about how the cell membrane was actually controlling the cell and not the genes, and that the cell membrane was picking up environmental information and using that information to control gene activity. Well, interesting, when I showed up at the Stanford School, I was really in need of a job, and I thought, well, I have two carousels of slides for my lecture. One carousel of slides was my conventional research on cloned muscle cells, which I had published in very respectable journals. But the other carousel I held in my hand was a whole series of slides about the new science, about how the membrane was actually controlling the genetic activity of the cells. As I walked up to the projector to put down one of the two carousels, I asked my dear friend who actually got me the introduction at Stanford, and I asked my friend Glenn, I said, Glenn, which of these topics should I talk about? And he said, talk about the muscle cloning research. That'll surely get you the job. That other stuff is kind of weird. And as I went up to the projector, I remember I had the muscle cloning stuff in my left hand and the weird science in my right hand. And as I got to the projector, some unknown force caused me to put the weird carousel into the projector. Glenn looked at me in surprise, like, you're really going to talk about that stuff? And I said, I just got to. If I can't talk about it here, then it's really not really worth coming here. So I get up to the front of the room, and then I notice something very interesting. I looked at my audience. There was a chairman of pathology, the chairman of biochemistry, the chairman of biology. There were the heads of Genentech research. All of these people were involved with genetic research. And I realized, oh my goodness, my talk is really so antagonistic to this audience. I didn't know how it was going to go. But I said, let's go with it. And I started giving the talk. And I just remember downloading my information and talking about it. And I was coming to a conclusion. And I turned around to write on the board my conclusion of this. And these words came out of the sky and into my head. And the words were saying, in conclusion, therefore, if you study genes as the end all of everything, then you're no better than a fundamentalist. And I thought, well, that sounded kind of funny. So I turned around to the audience and I say, <laughs> I told them, I said, well, that, you know, your work in genetics, that's no better than fun being a fundamentalist. And all of a sudden, I couldn't believe what happened. Everyone in that audience got 
red face. They started yelling at me. <laughs> they were just crazed by I said that I said this in this world of genetics. I remember that the response was so powerful, it blew me up against the blackboard that I was leaning against. And as they were yelling, and they didn't really want me to respond, as I was yelling, they were just venting themselves on me, and it kept going on and on, and I felt myself slipping down and slipping down, and I realized, oh my God, I heard a voice in my head that said, this job interview isn't going well, is it? And as I thought about that black Uber for a second, I further slipped down, and all of a sudden, my belt caught on the chalk tray. And it was a sign. It sort of said, this is as low as you're going to go. And then at that moment, I just stood up and I started yelling back at them. And the first thing I yelled at them is, look, you claim that genes are responsible for everything, but recognize this fact. There were living organisms on this planet before DNA was developed. And therefore, we have to have a completely different understanding on the nature of life. And I started yelling all kinds of things. I can't even remember. So it was a back and forth thing. <sighs> At the end, I thought, oh my God, well, this really ended badly. So I closed with, oh, well, thank you very much. And all of a sudden, there was this applause, which was like totally unexpected after the outburst that I experienced. And further at the end of that, the man who brought me there, uh, Dr. Marv Karasek, whose lab I was going to work in, in pathology and dermatology at Stanford, gave me a list of the names of these important people. And he said, I want you to meet with these people this afternoon as part of the job interview. And I looked at Marv and I said, no. I pushed the paper back to Marv and I said, no, I think I've wasted enough of their time as it is. And then he pushed the paper back to me and he said, Bruce, you provoked the hell out of them. And they really like that. And that is actually what got me the job at Stanford. And it was a wonderful experience because at Stanford, I expanded my insights into the nature of how environment uh, is controlling genes and more specifically, how our beliefs and our perceptions are primary in shaping genetics. Well, my Stanford job interview occurred in 1987. Since that time, all of the new research that I was talking about in those early days has become the leading edge of scientific research today in a new field called epigenetics, which is the field of how environment and our perception of the environment actually controls our genetic expression. The significance in regard to the story of breast cancer is how many women have been programmed to believe that if they have breast cancer genes that they can expect to have breast cancer in their lives. And people then have the feeling that just possession of the gene itself is really tantamount to having the cancer. It causes many people to do radical things. For example, Angelina Jolie had a double mastectomy to avoid the breast cancer she thought she was going to get because she was a person who had the BRCA1 cancer gene. Well, as soon as you say cancer gene, of course, that puts up all the red flags and lights and everybody gets all excited about cancer genes. Well, let me give you a simple fact. There is no gene that actually causes cancer. All genes are associated with disease but do not cause the disease. And let me emphasize this for this point. It turns out only 50% of the women that have the BRCA1 cancer gene actually get the cancer. The significance is science is always focused on those that get the cancer, but science has never really gone into the nature of how did that other 50% of the population with the gene did not get the cancer. To me, that's the more important part of the story because it reveals that lifestyle and beliefs and emotions are tightly locked into the expression of cancer and is the primary driver of the cancer and not the genes. So when we understand this, then we have to start looking at saying, yes, you might have breast cancer running in your family, but does that mean you're necessarily going to be a victim of that cancer yourself? And the answer is absolutely not, because you can take charge and power over your life. And it really is important because once you buy into the belief that the genes cause cancer, and the new science really discusses how belief controls our genes, guess what? You can think yourself into cancer. And this is basically the reverse of what is called the placebo effect. The placebo effect is when uh, a doctor offers a patient a new drug saying, this is the magic drug that is gonna cure your illness. And the patient believes that, guess what? They take the drug, they get well, and later find out that the drug was just a sugar pill. So what was actually healing them? And the answer was the belief. Yes, we're very much involved with the nature of positive beliefs and the placebo influence on health. But what I really want to draw your attention to is what is the consequence of a negative belief? And the fact is this, a negative belief is equally powerful in shaping your health, but in the opposite direction of a placebo. 
Actually, there's a scientific name for the influence of the negative belief. It's called the nocebo effect. The significance of that? Well, a positive belief can heal you. A negative belief can actually cause disease, can actually kill you as well. And this is why I want to bring this up, because once a woman gets a diagnosis that she may have breast cancer, it profoundly changes her belief system, her emotions, and her life in general. And it's not in a very positive way. The fear that is introduced by the concept that you may have cancer actually is a bigger promoter of cancer than the genes are. And this is really important for people to understand that you have power over your biology. And yet, we've been programmed that we are the victims of our genes. So in the new understanding, in the new science that we talk about in this series, we provide information about how your beliefs actually control genetic activity. And when you understand that, then you may be able to have much more influence and power in maintaining your health regardless of what genes you have because belief can change genes. It can actually cause mutant genes to read as normal genes. And unfortunately for most people, it can cause normal genes to act as mutant genes. And where this becomes problematic is that we now find that about 90% of breast cancer issues are not related to genes at all, and not related to heredity, but actually related to lifestyle. If you have knowledge of the new science of epigenetics, it's so empowering for a very simple reason. Remember the old statement, knowledge is power. And with the knowledge of how you actually control your genetics through the way you live, your diet, your lifestyle, and how your emotions also affect these genes, this empowers you to be the master of your health rather than waiting for the suggested cancer to show up. And this, for me, is the most important point that I can leave you with because the idea is this. You do not have to be a victim. And this is the most important insight because all of us have been programmed and that we are actually just an expression of our genes. This is not true. You are more powerful than you could ever imagine. And the new science is exactly that information to enhance that power and allow you to take charge and control your life. Uh, recent research has also in, involved another understanding, and that is this. There's a tendency to overmanage the concept of cancer, that so many women go for tests and then start to get an idea from their physician that they may be harboring a cancer or they may be developing a cancer and then go through radical kinds of treatment. But the recent reports revealed today that those early and very major interventions actually do not help the people at all. The same number of women die whether they had the intervention or not, and it really wasn't uh, because the intervention was in any way helpful in those early stage cancers. So what is the big problem? The big problem is this. We must let go that our lives are not in our control. And as emphasized in, in our video series, really have to recognize that the primary source that controls your life are your beliefs. And when we understand that, then we are the masters of our lives because we are the ones that can control our beliefs. In the next video, we're going to extend our story and talk about the nature of vaccines and tonsils, a very important topic in today's world. And as we leave, I just want to thank you for watching this video, and I look forward to your comments and appreciate your interest in this topic.